This is a continuation of the appendix of part one of Alexander and Rufus, uh, in which some remarks are being made with regard to a publication by a Baptist minister, uh, Robert Hall. With regard to pages 76 and 78, quote, Whatever is matter of duty is a part of some whole, the relation of which is susceptible of proof, either by the express decision of scripture or by general reasoning, and a point of practice, perfectly insulated and disjoined from the general system of duties, can never be satisfactorily vindicated. Unless I am much mistaken, the question under discussion will afford a striking exemplification of the justness of this remark. If it be found impossible to fix a medium betwixt the toleration of all opinions in religion and the restriction of it to errors not fundamental, I mean, such as are admitted to consist with the state of grace and salvation. When the necessity of tolerating imperfection is once admitted, there remains no point at which it can, it can consistently stop till it is extended to every gradation of error, the habitual maintenance of which is compatible with the state of salvation. Unquote. Remark. Error as such ought not be tolerated in any part of the Church of Christ, and though in this, as in other respects, perfect, perfection cannot be pretended, to by any particular church, yet no church ought to suffer any such error to be held or propagated by any in her communion, as would be a manifest denial of any article, fundamental or non-fundamental, of her public scriptural profession. From the text now just cited from Philippians 3.16, requires her to walk according to that profession, while it obliges her to walk according to what she has attained. This is evidently a medium between tolerating all error and perfect or complete freedom from it, a medium very different from that of tolerating errors not fundamental. Page 81, quote, The operation of speculative error on the mind in one of the profoundest secrets in nature is one of the profoundest secrets in nature, excuse me, and to determine the precise quantity of evil resulting from it in any given case except the single one of its involving a denial of fundamental truth, transcends the capacity of human nature. We must, in order to form a com correct judgment, be not only perfectly acquainted with the nature and tendency of the error in question, but also with the portion of attending it occupies, as well as the degree of zeal and attachment with which it is embraced. We must determine the force of its counteracting principles and how far it bears an affinity to the predominant feelings of him who maintains it, how far it coalesces with the weaker parts of his moral constitution. These particulars, however, it is next to impossible to explore. When the inquiry respects ourselves, how much more to establish a scale, which shall mark, by just gradations, the malignant influence of erroneous conceptions in others. Unquote. Remark. This passage seems to be elegantly written, but has little connection with the subject of admission to sacramental communion. When we consider error as hindering us from joining with any in sacramental communion, we do not consider it as in their hearts and consciences, where it can be judged by God alone, but as it is their public profession, in which case we may compare it with the word of God and with the public profession of the church and as according with that unerring rule. Mr. Hall allows that in one case the evil of it is plain, that is, that it involves the denial, the denial of fundamental truth, but that it is a real evil it is no less evident in other cases while it involves the denial of divine truth and of some particular article or articles of divine truth specified in the church's subordinate standards. Thus, when the officers of the church find persons openly and obstinately avowing tenets which are both contrary to the word of God and to the public profession of a church, and yet admit them to sacramental communion, they are manifestly betraying the trust committed to them. To see the evils in this case, we have no need to penetrate into the profoundest secrets of nature, or to intrude into those things which we have not seen, but only honestly to endeavor to walk by the same rule, to mind the same thing, to keep the white line in view. Pages 73 and 74. Quote, we freely admit the previous obligation of delaying to act till we have sufficient light, but in entire, but in entire cons uh, consistence excuse me, with this, we affirm that there is no hesitation and criterion of immediate duty in the is, but the criterion of immediate duty is the suggestion of conscience, whatever guilt may have been previously incurred by the neglect of serious and impartial inquiry. That this, under the modifications already specified, is the only criterion is sufficiently evident from the impossibility of conceiving any other. Hence, it is unquestionably the immediate duty of persons to celebrate the Eucharist when there is nothing in their principles to cause them to hesitate about it, they would be guilty of a deliberate and willful offense were they to neglect it, unquote. Remark. 
According to this doctrine, which a person, by adopting erroneous principles, and by the neglect of serious and impartial inquiry, has got his mind freed from all hesitation about the, uh, the rectitude of doing something which is really forbidden by the divine law, then he has sufficient light for proceeding immediately to act, and whatever guilt might have been incurred before by his neglect of inquiry, yet now the only criterion of his immediate duty is the suggestion of his conscience. There is an impossibility, it is said, of conceiving any others. And therefore, what he does is completely justified as being conformable to the only criterion of duty in the supposed case. This is sad causistry. Causistry, excuse me. For in the case supposed, the suggestion of conscience is quite wrong. As that never can be right which is forbidden by the divine law. Conscience is but a deputy, and must speak truly the will and mind of its Lord, the supreme lawgiver. Otherwise, it must not be acquiesced in, but remitted to his word, that it may be better informed. An erring conscience, indeed, brings a person into a dreadful dilemma, for if he disobeys it, he sins in despising what he himself takes to be the will of God attested by his deputy. On the other hand, if he obeys it, he sins, because what he does is contrary to the will of God revealed in his word. But this deplorable case arises neither from the law of God nor from the nature of conscience as such, but from the depravity of man's nature, and from the neglect or perversion of the means of its information, which is more immediately the person's sin in this case. Page 71. Quote, With regard to the error of those who differ from us in the interpretation of a particular precept, the proper antidote is calm, dispassionate argument, not the exercise of discipline, which is never to decide what is doubtful, nor to elucidate what is obscure. Unquote. Remark. In dealing with the erroneous, we are, no doubt, in the first place to use calm, dispassionate argument as the mean of convincing them of their error. By reasoning, we are to elucidate what is obscure and to remove doubts. But when such reasoning has been used and they continue obstinate opposers and contemners of any of the truths of God's word stated in the public profession of the church, censure then becomes necessary. Both these means are to be used. The one is not to be substituted for the other. Reasoning alone cannot serve in the place of censure, nor censure alone in the place of reasoning. Each of them is to be used in its own place as cases require. This author gives a very just view of a lawful secession in the following words. Page 63, quote, Whenever it becomes impossible to continue in a religious community without con concurring in practices and sanctioning abuses which the word of God condemns, a secession is justified by the apostolic voice, quote, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin, and that ye receive not of her plagues, unquote. On this principle, the conduct of the reformers in separating from the Roman hierarchy admits of an ample vindication. In consequence of the introduction of superstitious rites and ceremonies, it, become, it became impracticable to continue in her communion without partaking of her sins, and, for a simil, similar reason, the nonconformists seceded from the Church of England, where ceremonies are enforced, and an ecclesiastic, ecclesiastical polity established, incompatible as they conceived, with the purity and simplicity of the Church Institute." Unquote. Remark. It seems unnecessary to add what has been advanced in the preceding dialogues, on the inconsistency of having our sacramental communion with these churches or societies, from which we are, upon scriptural grounds, in a state of secession. The necessary import of our joining with these churches in public and sealing ordinances is that we profess our willingness to join in their communion, notwithstanding their refusal to reform, to turn, or turn from the evils which were the ground of our secession, a profession which is plainly the reverse of what this author allows to be the import of our secession. On joining with them, therefore, in these ordinances, it is plainly inconsistent with our state of secession and is therefore unlawful, while it is our duty to continue in that state. Some other pleas offered by some other pleas offered by this writer for his favorable plan of free communion have been considered in the preceding dialogues. It would be improper to enter into any particular examination of his opinions concerning baptism. And there's a lengthy footnote here. It is admitted that there was a difference between the baptism of John and that of the apostles and other ministers of Christ after his resurrection, as the former was before the full manifestation of him as the true Messiah and the latter after it. And also in this respect, that before the resurrection of Christ, baptism was not indispensably necessary as a sacrament a sacramental seal of admission into the church of God, whereas after his resurrection, when circumcision was abrogated, it was certainly necessary as such a seal. 
Before the resurrection of Christ, baptism served to seal men's admission into the church of God with regard to the New Testament dispensation, which was then beginning to be introduced. But after his resurrection, baptism served to seal their admission into his church absolutely, or in other words, it was the only sacramental seal of their admission into it. Before the resurrection of Christ, persons were sacramentally sealed as members of the church of God without baptism. But after his resurrection, baptism was the only way in which they could receive that seal. Hence, after the resurrection of Christ, baptism became equally necessary as circumcision had been, and all the members of the visible church with their infants are to be baptized. But notwithstanding these differences in respect of the time and the greater necessity of baptism after the resurrection of Christ than before it, we have good reason to hold that as that which has been hitherto taught in the Reformed churches in opposition to the Socinians and Papists, that the baptism of John and the baptism administered by the apostles and other ministers of Christ after his resurrection were essentially or in substance the same. Both were instituted by Christ, and both sign signified and sealed the same benefits of the covenant of grace. This doctrine is positively denied by Mr. Hull in various pretenses, as first, that, quote, John uniformly ascribes his baptism not to Christ, but to the Father, unquote. Answer, it does not follow that it being from God the Father, that it is not instituted by Christ. For all things that Christ did as mediator were of God by him. Secondly, that, quote, the baptism of John required only the Jewish faith, the appearance of the Messiah, with the additional circumstances that it was at hand. But the baptism of the apostles required the faith that Jesus of Nazareth was the identical person who was the Messiah, unquote. Answer. The faith which the truly pious among the Jews had in the Messiah was materially the same with the faith of true believers now. And John directed the faith of those whom he baptized to the identical person, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. Thirdly, quote, that Christian baptism was invariably administered in the name of Jesus, while John's was not performed in that name, for when he began to baptize, he did not know him, unquote. Answer. The expression, I knew him not, means that he had never seen him so as to distinguish his bodily appearance. But he certainly knew the identical person and baptized in his name, whose forerunner he was, who was preferred before him, whose shoes latched he was not worthy to unloose. In Acts 19.5, Paul says that John baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Fourthly, that, quote, baptism instituted by our Lord was distinguished by the superior effects of it from that of his forerunner, unquote. Matthew 3. Answer. The opposition stated in that text is not between the external part of John's baptism and the external part of that which was instituted by Jesus Christ, but between the external part which was performed by John and is performed by any ministers of the New Testament and the internal part which is the prerogative of Jesus Christ to effectuate. It is granted that a far greater effusion of the Holy Spirit attended baptism as administered by the apostles than what attended John's baptism, but does not follow that the former was essentially different from the latter. The Lord the Spirit makes the same ordinances more effectual at one time than at another, according to his good pleasure. Fifthly, that, quote, if John's baptism had been the same as our Lord's, Paul would not have administered the latter to such as had already received the former, unquote. Acts 19.5 Answer. The various opinions of commentators concerning this passage, and none that I have heard, seems to be seems to me more reasonable than that of Beza, Glaucius, Walthurus, and many other judicious divines. Namely, that the words referred to in chapter 5, verse 5, are the words of Paul showing the disciples at Ephesus that those who had been baptized by John, or according to his doctrine, ought not to have been so ignorant in these as these disciples were of the gift which was to be bestowed on the church of the Holy Spirit. Since those whom John baptized were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, of whom John always testified that he would baptize in the name of the Holy Spirit. The Greek particles, men, which our translators have rendered verily in the beginning of Paul's speech and day in the beginning of verse, uh, in the beginning of chapter 5, verse 5, which ought not to have been overlooked as in our translation, as it is in our translation, and which might have been rendered but would by no means allow us to say, says Beza, to break the connection of this speech by ascribing the former part to Paul and the latter part to Luke. Examples of the use of these corresponding particles are common as in Matthew 3, verse 11 and Matthew 9, 37. See the observations of Dr. Guise on this passage. Back to the text on the page. But it seems preposterous to contend so strenuously for the necessity of what he calls a free participation of the Lord's Supper while he represents the want of baptism, even in those who reject opportunities continually afforded of them of obtaining it as no way blamable and no bar to the enjoyment of all the other privileges of the visible church. Surely baptism is no less necessary than the Lord's Supper, and in the scriptural order of these ordinances the former precedes the latter.
A Christian should neither neglect baptism nor yet receive it after his partaking of the Lord's Supper. There is no scriptural warrant either for the one or the other.